Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for attending, joining this uh, virtual side event uh, promoting evidence based drug policies and interventions enshrined in human rights in Europe uh, in the 64th session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Uh, my name is Oriol Esculias. I work in Association Project Hombre, which is organizing this event, but on behalf of the EU Civil Society Forum on Drugs. Um, and it has uh, the support, uh, special support of the precisely the European Union, the governments of Portugal and Spain, and the Council of Europe and the Pompidou Group. Uh, first, of all, uh, I would like to, to inform that the, the side event is being recorded and also that please uh, feel free to pose any questions or remarks using the Q&A uh, section instead of the chat and we will try to answer them at the end of the presentation depending on the time left. Uh, without delay, I uh, would like, uh, I'm so delighted to introduce uh, Marie Nourir, uh, from International Drug Policy Consortium. Uh, she is the coordinator of the Working Group for International Relations of the Civil Society Forum on Drugs. And she's been working so hard organizing this uh, initiative uh, with us. So we ask her to, to give the preliminary remarks uh, on behalf of the Civil Society Forum on Drugs. Uh, please, Marie, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Ariel, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're based. Um, so I would like to start by thanking Ariel and uh, everybody from Association Proyecto Hombre for hosting this side event on behalf of the EU Civil Society Forum on Drugs and to all of our co-sponsors for their ongoing support. As Ariel said, so I'm Marie Lugier. I'm the head of research and communications at the International Drug Policy Consortium, but I'm also a member of the core group of the CSFD. And um, as you said, I'm chairing the working group on international drug policy issues. And so it's within the sphere of this working group that we are organizing this side event today. In this event, we wanted to showcase some of the work done by the CSFD and its members in the areas of evidence-based and human rights informed drug policy advocacy and service provision. But we also wanted to provide an opportunity for European policymakers to pre present some examples of drug policy strategies and programs that are grounded in the fundamental principles of human rights and health promotion. So I'm really, really happy that we have with us representatives from the EU, from the Pompidou Group and the Spanish government, all of which are really strong promoters of civil society engagement in drug policy debates. The CSFD itself has a strong history of advocating for a human rights-based approach to drug policy, it was established in 2007, and it's now recognized as an expert group of the European Commission. It's composed of 45 member organizations from across Europe. And although the CSFD members may have different views on some aspects of drug policy, we can all agree that drug policies and programs should be grounded in health and should be grounded in human rights. And in particular, that the voices of those most affected should be meaningfully reflected in policy design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. And so in this regard, the CSFD has been engaged in regular dialogue with the EU to bring our experience and expertise to the decision-making table. And I would only like to mention just two examples here of our work. So first of all, the CSFD has been closely engaged in the evaluation of the EU Drug Action Plan for 2017 to 2020. And after that, we've sought to influence the new EU drug strategy for the periods 2021 to 2025. And so in that process, we provided detailed inputs and recommendations on various iterations of the document. And we are really grateful to the EU and in particular the German presidency for reflecting our views in the final document. And we look forward to further engaging with the EU and the Portuguese presidency in particular on the accompanying action plan on drugs. But it's probably in the area of international drug policy that we've created the closest ties with the EU. During and since the 2016 ANGAT on drugs, the CSFD has been regularly consulted by the EU. And we were grateful to see our recommendations very well incorporated in various EU statements at the 2016 ONGAS, the 2019 ministerial uh, segment, uh, and the yearly CND. 
Are concerns in particular about civil society space in international debates or the visibility given to the ONGAS outcome document, the UN system common position on drugs and the international guidelines on human rights and drug policies have been taken on board by the EU. And although we don't agree on everything here again, we're very grateful for the ongoing opportunities provided to the CSFD to engage in EU decision-making processes on drugs. However, and despite all the progress that we have made over the past few years, none of us can afford to be complacent. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown everyone the urgent need to put human rights and communities at the center of drug policies. Firstly, to reduce prison overcrowding and the ongoing over-incarceration of people who use drugs. Secondly, to consider prevention, risk and harm reduction, treatment, care and recovery programs as essential services, in particular at times of COVID-19. And thirdly, to promote and protect, but also to resist moves that may hamper civil society space at all levels of policymaking. So it's important to stress here that these issues did not arise because of COVID-19. They predate the pandemic. And I'm afraid that they will continue well beyond the health crisis. And Peter Saruzzi is going to provide a bit more information on these issues in his own presentation. So I'm not going to go into more detail here. But I just wanted to finish with a plea for all policymakers in Europe, but beyond as well, to bring visibility to these issues, to put reforms forward when they are urgently needed, and to continue to involve civil society at every step of decision making, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation on drugs issues. So thank you so much once again, and I look forward to the discussions. Thanks, thanks a lot, Marie. Uh, brilliant as always, uh, trying to frame uh, briefly but detail and precise the subject in this case of the of this initiative. Thank you so much. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Peter Salozzi. Executive Director of the Rights Reporter Foundation from Hungary. Uh, I think that he will raise the voice of civil society as one of the members of the Civil Society Forum on Drugs. Peter, you have the floor. Good morning and thank you, Oreo. Uh, as Ma Marie pointed out uh, in her introduction, I will address three uh, pressing human rights issues from the perspective of uh, European civil society that were exacerbated by the ongoing COVID crisis. But as, as Mary pointed out, neither of these problems are the result of the COVID epidemic, uh, but the situation was far from ideal even before the, the crisis. What is more, this crisis provided us civil society some new opportunities by creating a room and need for innovation. So the first problem, although mass incarceration is not as severe in Europe as in America, prisons are overcrowded in many EU member states with Belgium, France, Italy, and my own country, Hungary, on the top of the list. A significant number of prisoners are imprisoned for minor drug-related offenses in Europe. In most countries, these prisoners have no or very limited access to treatment and harm reduction services. Prisoners are one of the most vulnerable groups when it comes to COVID, but are often forgotten when it comes to vaccination or other health responses. Since the introduction of lockdown, lockdown measures, prisoners are deprived of basic human rights, such as access to a lawyer, family members, and even hygienic products and quality food in many member states. There are 16-year-old inmates who could not speak to their parents for several months. The violation of the right to free, fair trial is, regular, is, is also regular. One in five prisoners in Europe are in pre-trial detention and their rate is increasing during the COVID crisis. Despite the call of many international organizations to examine ways to release prisoners to reduce uh, the risk of COVID infections, only a few European countries responded pro positively. But the positive impact of early release, of, early release programs, if they if the re-entry re to community is supported, is documented in, in many countries, including Ireland. Uh, even countries that have implemented uh, decongestion measures have failed in many cases to prevent or reduce the continued and disproportionate arrest and imprisonment of people for mining, minor drug offenses. This undermines attempts to reduce prison overcrowding. This crisis underlines the desperate need for criminal justice reform, as well as introducing and scaling up those alternatives to coercive sanctions that are promoted by the European Council. 
Why is it that member states, member states are reluctant to provide alternatives of incarceration when we know that they are more cost effective than imprisonment? Why is it more important to enforce drug laws than to ensure the rights of prisoners to life and health? The second problem, social and health services for people who use drugs remain chronically and disproportionately underfunded, especially in comparison with supply reduction measures. The EU drug strategy required member states to scale up harm reduction services, but what we witnessed in some member states was scaling down and not scaling up. In countries like Bulgaria, Romania and Hungary, needle and syringe programs had to close down due to lack of funding and lack of political commitment leaving tens of thousands of injecting drug users without any access to healthcare system in the deadly grip of poverty and social exclusion. Why is it that some member states enthusiastically enforce drug laws against drug users, but their enthusiasm disappears when it comes to ensuring their basic human rights to accessing life-saving treatment? Why is it always treatment and harm reduction programs are the first victims of budget cuts during the crisis? Again, although the COVID epidemic further limited the access to health services, we can also see inspiring examples of innovations too. Harm reduction programs were always in the forefront of supporting the most marginalized groups of society from the worst effects of the epidemic and lockdown measures. For example, restrictive rules of opiate substitution programs were relaxed in several countries, allowing clients to access their medications without the obligation to show up every day. In, in several European cities, homeless people who use drugs were provided with special emergency shelters with links to treatment and sometimes safe supply of medications. Third problem, the space for civil society has been shrinking in many European countries and around the world. In a period when uh, it is a growing challenge to raise sustainable funding for civil society organizations, some member states are increasingly hostile to, the, to civil society organizations. For example, in my own country, Hungary, uh, independent organizations that receive international funding have to register and are scapegoated as foreign agents. Civil liberties are increasingly restricted due to COVID-related measures, and this, together with economic hardships, has a disproportional impact on vulnerable populations, especially. Organizations representing and advocating these groups need more protection, support, and funding from the EU. My organization has been documenting the responses to uh, COVID crisis in European cities. Our findings clearly indicate that civil society has shown incredible resilience and has proven to be a very valuable partner of policymakers during the crisis. In cities and countries where civil society was meaningfully involved in responding to the crisis, more innovative and more effective solutions were introduced. Why is it that many member states are more afraid of those civil society organizations that raise awareness on social problems than of the social problems themselves? Why is it that too often human rights remain nice ideas put on paper, but they are not taken seriously when it comes to the least popular groups of society? This crisis exposed and escalated the pre-existing inequalities and human rights violations in our society. Instead of returning to the false and fragile normalcy of the pre-COVID period, we need to learn from the mistakes of the past and make sustainable changes for the future. The innovations introduced during the COVID crisis such as the early release of prisoners, the relaxation of OST rules, or providing homeless people with shelter, food, and medicines are reported to improve their health and well being of vulnerable people. So, why don't we keep and mainstream these innovations after the crisis ends? We need drug policies that do not deprive people of their human rights, but empower communities to stay healthy and safe, especially if they are poor and marginalized. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Peter. I think uh, the audience uh, appreciates your um, concerning, uh, but also, uh, I mean, optimistic re report of the, of the situation nowadays. Thank you so much. Okay, now our next uh, panelist is Edith Hofer, uh, team leader of the drugs policy team in the European Commission, from whom we are uh, very honored that she has invited the invitation to speak today with us. Thank you so much, Edith.
Thank you very much, Oriol. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or I don't know, good night uh, to all of the participants wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me and an honor to be here today at this event organized by Association Projecto Ombre on behalf of the Civil Society Forum on Drugs, together with the other distinguished speaker and of course with this invisible audience which makes life a bit more complicated. Drug policy is a particularly dynamic and international concern that has seen significant reforms over the last 30 years and more. Europe and the rest of the world have developed, implemented and adapted measures and policies to reduce the demand and supply of drugs, as well as related harms. Our collective experiences, especially including the civil society experience over the past decades have shown that the drug phenomenon is very fast changing. We are now facing different evolutions and new patterns of consumption, increased production and new transit channels, not to mention new substances. And as we just heard, we, don't, we continue to face a set of older issues that persist, but we also have uh, many new uh, problems uh, coming up or phenomenons coming up. The new EU drug strategy 2020, 2021 to 2025 is ever based on a detailed assessment of what actually the previous strategic document and its action plans have delivered. Uh, evaluation is evidence. Evaluation is an essential element for any political action because it gives us a parameter of the effectiveness and the relevance of policies done and a compass for future drug policies. The EU drug strategy provides the overarching political framework and the priorities for the European Union uh, for its drug policy for the next five years. It is, it takes as previous strategies, an evidence-based, integrated, balanced and multidisciplinary approach to the drugs phenomenon, not only at the European level, but also at national and international level. It incorporates a gender equality and a health equity perspective as well. The strategy aims to protect and improve the well-being of society and of the individual, to protect and promote public health, to offer a high level of security and well-being for the public, and to increase health literacy. It is built on three main strands, which are supported by three cross-cutting themes. The main strands or pillars are one, it's drug supply reduction, enhancing security, two, drug demand reduction, prevention, treatment and care service, and three, addressing drug-related harms. It's important for me to underline that the strategy for the first time develops and highlights a harm reduction framework under a self-standing pillar and the same level of importance as demand and supply reduction. This pillar addresses drug-related harms by focusing on measures and policies that prevent or reduce the possible health and social risks and harm for users, for society, and in the prison setting. And we just heard from Peter how important the last one is as well. As part of this harm reduction framework, we also place more focus on alternatives to incarceration for non-violent, low-level participants and illicit drug markets. The EU continues very firmly to advocate for the worldwide abolition of the death penalty for drug-related offenses. This is also a very important principle included in the new strategy. Key international documents such as the Free UN Drug Conventions, the 2016 UNGAS Outcome Document, the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development, and the International Guidelines on Human Rights and Drug Policy, just to name a few, are important paces for our strategy. The UNGAS Outcome Document is and remains the most comprehensive policy document on international drug policy. And I would like to congratulate to the five year anniversary of its adoption. We will have another side event today which uh, will pay tribute to this outcome document and its impacts uh, in the afternoon. Based on the strategy, which has been adopted in December, as also Marie said, the Council of the EU is currently negotiating under the leadership of the Portuguese presidency an action plan, which should be adopted by mid-year. 
We recognize that the impact, the impact that drugs have on quality of life and health on, of so many people and how complex and invasive the drug markets really are. This is why the drug strategy is our adapted response to this situation and will be implemented with a focus on public health, on the protection of youth and of the vulnerable populations, a fight against stigma and discrimination, human rights, but while also fighting against organized crime and money laundering within the EU and internationally. Although the action plan itself has not been implemented and has not been adopted yet, and as I said before, it's probably uh, to be adopted only by mid-2021, uh, we believe that we have to urgently move to implementation of the strategy. And for that, we will rely uh, on civil society as a crucial partner, because they are the ones working most closely with the people who use drugs. The Civil Society Forum on Drugs provided important input in the evaluation of the previous strategy and the development of the current strategy. And for that, I would really like to uh, thank you all for your inputs and for your constant involvement. And this is also something we want to continue, the active involvement of civil society in the future in the context of drugs policy. Finally, let me mention something, uh, even if it's maybe not 100% uh, um, in the human rights area, we still have to look at the bigger picture in terms of drug trafficking. Also, especially we're looking at where the money uh, is used, what the money is used for. So therefore, we also have to step up actions against organized crime so that they cannot infiltrate, infiltrate for example, uh, legal economies. Uh, and continue the work. Therefore, the Commission has adopted yesterday a new strategy to tackle organized crime, which responds to these increasing challenges. It was adopted yesterday, as I said, and I'll, welcome, uh, I'll invite you to also look at this uh, as it's part of our EU drug strategy as well. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat or afterwards if there is time. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you so much, Adit, uh, which is uh, also brilliant uh, to fit within this tight time such a complex uh, issue and trying to, to share with us a bit the EU strategy on drugs. We could maybe afterwards uh, discuss about how COVID pandemic uh, will, I mean, will menace in a way the purposes or uh, the, 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 the objectives of this uh, EU plan, which is excellent. Okay, uh, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Juan Ramon Villalbi. Uh, I think it's certainly one of the greatest experts on drug policy uh, today as chief uh, delegate of the National Plan on Drugs of the Government of Spain, the Ministry of Health. Uh, please, uh, doctor, you have the floor. Thank you, Oriol, and thank you all for uh, being here with us. It's really a pleasure to, to, to be together with all of you um, in, in, this, in this event. Uh, and I'm really happy to be part of this panel with Proyecto Hombre. Uh, we have been colleagues and friends for decades. We have been working together to improve uh, the situation on, uh, in the drug scene and drug, and drug policies in, in Spain. I'm going to share some slides with you, so it's going to be more interesting than watching my face, uh, I think. Uh, <clears throat> and, and what I will try to do is, let's see if I am able to do it. I hope it is being visible. Uh, what I'll try to do is to share with you some thoughts on how uh, in Spain over decades we have been evolving uh, uh, and, and fostering what we in some way call the Spanish model. The Spanish model, which really is based on the idea that uh, the international principles that uh, the, the United Nations foster guide our policy. And this, of course, have to do with international uh, drug control conventions, but they also have to do with the human rights. And, and these two uh, principles, uh, which are at the core of, of the international governance uh, of our societies uh, are within our 
current strategy and previous strategies. We are now with uh, the current strategy, national strategy for drugs and addictions, uh, which is built on a public health perspective, thinking about the person, the victim, its setting, its community, which uh, tries to give a universal response with uh, free coverage of services by the National Health Service, uh, providing a response according to the needs and giving priority to the most vulnerable and trying to get some coherence and collaboration among all public administrations. The strategy and the plans that define it uh, are always built from our office, the National Plan on Drugs uh, delegation, but also together with our regional governments, uh, together with experts, together with NGOs, together with researchers, uh, together we design what are the objectives for the period, and we all provide inputs to progress towards reaching those objectives. We also try to mine diversity, and we also think that there's a public responsibility, but it's also a social responsibility. And uh, we've had 35 years now of consecutive national plans on drugs. And the uh, good thing is that in general, they have been grounded on a consensus, a consensus that has made them relatively continuous over government changes uh, and ideology in government, which is not doesn't happen in other spheres of public policy in our country, unfortunately, perhaps. Uh, but let's say also that one of the big things we've learned is from difficulties. Uh, and, and our story begins with a disaster, a catastrophe. That was the heroin epidemic in Spain, which began in the late 70s, but evolved uh, tremendously over the, over the 1980s. It was a new problem. We had no professionals trained. We had no specialized centers. There was a very confused ideology and public image about drugs, mixing, cannabis, heroin, everything seemed to be the same, and it was not the same. Most uh, heroin users were rebuffed by the healthcare system. They were kicked out. They could find not help. And uh, heroin began a bit everywhere, but very quickly it concentrated in the most deprived neighborhoods. And it was white heroin, which was injected, which dominated the market at the time. That's not true anymore. There was a mix now and, and that north-south divide within the country. Uh, and these conditions made the ground for a, our tremendous HIV and AIDS epidemic in the 90s, which was a, a second disaster hitting very hard the same population. So th th that was the context of our first national plan on drugs. And the national plan on drugs made big step forward. Uh, and I think the main challenges then and now are the same. And they're the same, in fact, for all public health issues. We must understand and measure problems. We must identify interventions that are useful, effective to respond to problems. We must test them. We must evaluate them all the time. And we must ensure, and that's very important, that the most effective programs and interventions reach everyone. It's very nice to have a nice, an effective program, but it, it remains very local and doesn't reach everyone. We miss opportunities that could be uh, useful for any. Um, our first priority, of course, was to ensure that we had a network for care and treatment that was based on science. Because at the beginning, as I said, we had no uh, trained professionals, we had no specific services, and care was based on charismatic responses, based on goodwill, but not very effective. So developing a network of therapeutic communities, uh, detoxification units in acute hospitals, uh, the first one was opened in 1981, it's going to be now 40 years since we opened our first unit in Hospital del Mar in Barcelona. Uh, and the backbone of the system are the ambulatory treatment centers for addictions uh, with professionals, with doctors, with nurses, with psychologists, with social workers. Uh, uh, th that's the backbone of the system. Also, day centers, some mobile units in metropolitan areas. Then we began to take care of or think more about those who did not reach treatment because they were not ready for it. So we began to develop drop-in centers uh, where they could shower, where they could get coffee, soup, uh, 
And uh, from there, we developed into harm reduction interventions. Well, of course, opioid substitution therapy can be seen as the, the first and basic, but, but beyond that, we developed low threshold uh, treatment centers uh, that would admit people who were not def definitely in, on treatment, but who could get some initial help. And we have developed some supervised consumption facilities in some of the major cities in Bilbao, in Barcelona and its surroundings, in Madrid, that's unfortunately uh, no longer operational. And we're confronting now what is one of our big problems we haven't solved yet, the, the residential needs of many drug users who are homeless. And the pandemic uh, has been important there. And um, I want to emphasize this uh, method and maintenance therapy was crucial. This, this graph shows survival analysis of people in, in addiction treatment. And uh, for most alcohol treatment, uh, cocaine treatment, uh, cannabis treatment, uh, after one year of treatment, about 40% remain in treatment because addictions by definition are chronic and relapsing. Now for heroin users, only 5% were on treatment after a year. So we needed to find a way and the response was methadone maintenance therapy. Because with methadone maintenance therapy, we could maintain heroin users on treatment about the same rate than the other addiction patients. About 40% remained in treatment after one year. I think that's very important because that provided the ground to be able to work with them and improve their, 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 their pronostic. Uh, let me mention the harm reduction facilities. These are pictures from the Beloit Center in, in, in Barcelona. These are spaces where drug users can walk in, bring their own substance, but they'll find clean material, they'll find uh, health supervision. Uh, if they overdose, they'll have quick help. Uh, and, and they begin interaction with health professionals. And this beginning uh, of interaction, uh, we have many examples that show that it shortens the way to treatment for those people who were not ready for treatment. But once they begin contact with the system, uh, it's much more likely that they'll be able to, re to, 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 to decide they will enter treatment and they will change. And mortality declined. Uh, our estimates of mortality show it very clearly. Uh, it's now stable. Uh, we need to make further efforts, uh, but, but, but it's not what it was uh, years ago. Uh, let, me mention, let me insist a little bit, as Peter Sarosi said, COVID has brought the issue of homelessness very much to the front because uh, many drug users are homeless and very often substance use is a cause for exclusion from the mainstream social services, such as shelters for the homeless. Uh, they're kicked out of these facilities. And during the time of extreme confinement because of COVID, this issue was pressing. And in our large cities, there's been two options uh, in some more flexible rules. So they, they could get into general shelters, um, perhaps with external support from addiction services, intensive external support from addiction services, medication, uh, other professional help. But in some other cities, we've had specific facilities for substance users, and sometimes involving integrated harm reduction schemes. For instance, providing beer or wine for those who otherwise would leave the facility to, to get it. Or, or for instance, providing a space for uh, safe and supervised consumption of drugs. This is an issue we need to address better. We need more facilities like this. COVID has confronted us with, with this need and it's key for improving treatment outcomes because if you are homeless, the, the, the likelihood that you will continue on treatment and progress is, is much lower. And uh, I think that's all. Uh, we have very uh, tight schedule in this panel and uh, uh, I just want to say that we will continue. Uh, thank you all. Muchas gracias. And uh, we're riding towards the future and hopefully improving together. So thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Villalbe, uh, for sharing uh, this, uh, I mean, the adjusting uh, model in Spain, uh, also recognizing uh, the challenges that we all must uh, deal with, uh, not only Spain, but 
you were today talking about Spain. Thank you so much. Um, well, um, I will introduce now Dennis Hubbard. Um, for a last minute uh, inconvenience, he will uh, speak on behalf of Hannah Bardell. Um, he is um, executive uh, secretary of the Pompidou Group. So I take also this opportunity to congratulate for the 50 years of this uh, amazing uh, journey, 50 years of the Pompidou Group. And he, he will speak on behalf of the Council of Europe. Thank you so much. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I will not speak on behalf of Anna Bardell because uh, I'm not the author of the report that she has made on uh, human rights and drug policy, even if we have contributed uh, to a large extent to the production of this, such a report. I will rather uh, use the opportunity of the, this uh, unfortunate uh, problem that Anna Barnell has not been able to connect uh, to bring to the audience a wider scope, uh, of course, including the recent report of the Parliament Assembly, uh, uh, which has been adopted in October uh, 2020 uh, under the responsibility of Anna Barnell, but also uh, more largely of our recent developments in the Pompidou Group. As you mentioned, uh, we are celebrating uh, this year the 50th anniversary of the Pompidou Group. It has been created uh, in, back in 1971 uh, through an initiative of uh, the, the late French President Georges Pompidou. And it was the first time that uh, European countries have brought their efforts together uh, to tackle the issue of uh, what was at the time an emerging problem is uh, the, the use of drugs uh, within European population and, uh, and also to, to fight the trafficking of drugs. So the creation of the Pompidou Group in 1971 uh, was uh, against the background, background which has changed a lot uh, over the last 50 years because the most uh, important objective of the Pompidou Group was at the time to fight against drug trafficking and uh, to uh, tackle, uh, address the issue of drug abuse among European population. At the time, there were seven countries which created the Pompidou Group, the six countries which, had, which were uh, members of the European community, plus the United Kingdom, because uh, uh, Georges Pompidou, as you probably, as you all know, uh, had already decided at the time that he would not, not veto anymore the candidature of uh, the United Kingdom to the European community. So he wanted to include the, the United Kingdom from the start in this new European framework. The focus of the Pompidou group has changed when it has been integrated in the framework of the Council of Europe, that was in 1980. During nine years, the Pompidou Group has lived its own, its own life as an autonomous body, but after 1980, it was decided to integrate it into the framework of the legal and political framework of the Council of Europe. And this, of course, has changed the approach because, as you know, the Council of Europe is about democracy, uh, human rights, and the rule of law. This is the DNA of the Council of Europe. And so, the, the approach of the Pompidou Group has changed after its integration into the Council of Europe. And especially over the last decade, there have been a lot of a strong focus has been given to human rights in drug policies. Uh, and this includes cooperation with civil society, because uh, also it is in the DNA of the Council of Europe to cooperate with civil society. And when you want to address an issue such as human rights, you need to work with civil society. Civil society at large, but also, of course, and in particular, uh, the organizations, which uh, are the voices of drug users and their relatives in Europe. Uh, in, the, in the last years, uh, a policy paper has been adopted on interaction with civil society that was in 20. 15 and then in 2017 a policy paper on human rights and drug policies 
that governments should uh, implement uh, in their uh, drug policies. Then it came to an initiative of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which was should have been the main subject of uh, this intervention because he, Anna Bardell, uh, as a rapporteur, has produced a very interesting and important report, which has been adopted by the Parliamentary Assembly in, on 12 October 2020. And this report uh, led to the adoption of two important texts. The first one is a recommendation by the Parliamentary Assembly to the Committee of Ministers, where the Parliamentary Assembly is, is asking to the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe to take collective action in the field of drug policy and human rights. This uh, is currently being discussed within the Committee of Ministers, so there is no reply yet to this recommendation. We have to wait uh, what will be the position of the Committee of Ministers, and there is also a resolution which is directly addressing to the member states of the Council of Europe. So that means that each individual member state can make the follow-up which it deemed uh, useful or necessary with this resolution. And uh, I would say that the, the most uh, far-reaching and ambitious uh, proposals of the report are in the resolution because uh, uh, we know in the Council of Europe that it's not always very easy to have a collective action taken by the Committee of Ministers. There are 47 member states and they have, they have quite different approaches and it's not easy to come to a collective action. But when you address individually to all member states, then you may expect that at least some of them will take action on the basis of these uh, proposals. Then uh, we also um, have an important issue which is currently being discussed by the Committee of Ministers. It is the revised statute of the, of the Pompidou Group. It has been uh, my main work over the last two years uh, to let, lead the discussions together with the Portuguese presidency on the new statute of the Pompidou Group. Uh, we have uh, reached an agreement within the Pompidou Group member states on a, a draft revised statute. And I can maybe say a few words about this draft revised statute, which is at this stage only a proposal by the member states of the Pompidou Group to the Committee of Ministers. So it's also still under discussion. And uh, I would not uh, reveal a, a secret uh, by telling you that the discussions are a little bit complicated. By the way, this afternoon, they are, we will resume the discussions on the revised statute. But for the moment, the text as it stands uh, contains quite important steps forward. First of all, it reaffirms the multi multidisciplinary nature of the drug problem. So we need to tackle the drug issue uh, with different uh, fronts, on different fronts. Of course, are, we have the activities on law enforcement, but also we need to foster prevention, training. Uh, we need also to, uh, to work together with uh, education ministries, for example, the health ministries. So it's a, it's a very transversal issue and it's important to re reaffirm this multidisciplinary nature. The second uh, important uh, thing is the strong focus on human rights, which is in the revised statute. Of course, as I mentioned, the Pompidou Group has al already been working on human rights and drug policy, especially over the last decade. But if the statute is adopted by the Committee of Ministers, this, this would become a statutory mission of the Pompidou Group to promote human rights in the conception adoption, implementation, and evaluation of drug policy. So th this would be a, a very important qualitative step forward if it is adopted, and we hope it will. Then the third uh, important issue in this statute is uh, the fact that the mandate of the Pompidou Group would be extended beyond the issue of illicit drugs, so we will be able to tackle also other forms of addictions, like uh, especially the new forms of addictions through internet, like gambling or gambling. Another uh, very important step forward is 
to reaffirm very strongly in this new statute the identity of the Pompidou Group as a Council of Europe entity, which brings at the same time the added value of the Pompidou Group. And we will, uh, we are already doing, but we will strengthen a lot the synergies that we have with a number of uh, other Council of Europe entities, such as the, the Commissioner of Human Rights of the, of the Council of Europe, the, the Committee on the Prevention of Torture, the, com the Committee on Human Rights, Intergovernmental Body, and other uh, important entities of the Council of Europe. And of course, also the Par Parliamentary Assembly, who has just adopted the report that I mentioned. And Mrs. Bardell has been entrusted by the Parliamentary Assembly to follow up the report. Then uh, we are also... Here, Dennis. Yes, I'm, af I'm afraid that you should, you should be ending. Yes. Because okay. then we have done. Thanks, thanks a lot. Just one last word among the synergies that you when we want to establish is also uh, to strengthen our synergies with civil society. And uh, I see at least one person here who knows that uh, I'm serious about that. It's not all it's also not an, a very easy issue to discuss. Currently, there are some resistances, but uh, I'm very committed as executive secretary and the Portuguese presidency uh, to move forward on this front. Thanks a lot, Dennis Haber, and we appreciate uh, your uh, your willingness to to take part of this uh, this side event in these conditions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, there's still, I think, three four minutes for questions. Uh, I would like to raise at least two to the panelists. Uh, the first one says uh, is from Regina. Matson says prevention is an integral part of the new EU, uh, EU agenda and action plan on drugs. Uh, I am lacking this perspective in the webinar. Could you elaborate or how the civil society forum on drugs is working with prevention in different areas? There is also another question from Juan Fernandez, but maybe we, we, you could first try to reply this one would like to, to answer, maybe Peter, Maria. Yeah, maybe I can answer that. Um, so the Civil Society Forum on Drugs has several experts who have extensive knowledge and expertise on the field of prevention. And uh, in our official positions and, uh, and recommendations, we always emphasize the need for evidence-based prevention interventions in member states. Uh, the working group, the Civil Society Forum on Drug has, and which uh, maybe has the most, you know, strong focus on, on prevention is the one on the quality standards of uh, demand uh, reduction. So we have four, four working groups and one working group is uh, working on how to implement the minimum standards for drug demand reductions in, in member states. So they produced several surveys and reports uh, on this issue. You can find more information on, on our website, the Civil Society Forum on Drugs website. But uh, it's a very good point, and we think prevention is very important. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. And Juan Fernandez says uh, there's currently multiple countries in the EU and its neighborhood considering very different legal regimes for the cultivation and use of cannabis. These include government initiatives in Luxembourg, Malta, North Macedonia, and Spain by one of the coalition partners and pilot, and pilot supply projects in the Netherlands and Switzerland. The question is, uh, is the EU fostering any spaces for discussing and reflection between member states and neighbors to discuss the human rights potential of these initiatives? Who would like to reply to this question? Uh, I'm happy to take a first go, but um, I'm not going to be able to answer the question, obviously, uh, totally. Uh, I would just like, I wanted to reply to the question already saying we have a lot of fora to discuss cannabis policies in the widest sense, because, of course, as you know, there is not just 
the let's call it illegal part of cannabis but there are loads of these products which are coming on the market and sold in across Europe in in shops and so on so there are loads of discussions uh, and we will certainly also address the issue of human rights and I think what the colleague has uh, raised in this context uh, about, for example, incarceration in some countries still for these minor uh, issues and so on. So there is plenty of discussion ongoing and we will definitely continue this. And if I remember some of the meetings of the Civil Society for on Drugs, this was also there already discussed uh, extensively. But I'm happy if the colleagues add to uh, the more human rights dimension. Yeah, I mean, I, I can continue. I mean, I think within the Civil Society Forum on Drugs, uh, there is some uh, division in terms of the way forward on cannabis regulation in general. Uh, so I'm going to respond in my personal capacity as IDPC. So now that uh, some models of legal regulation have been applied, I think the main debate is not about whether or not to legally regulate. It's about there are countries now legally regulating cannabis and maybe other plants as well. So we're looking into the social justice issues related to re legal regulation and also the human rights components of it. Uh, the racial justice, the gender equality. So that's what we're trying to push for now uh, to make sure that the legally regulated models that are applied respond to these issues. Um, so there are debates ongoing within civil society on these specific issues. And yeah, I hope that we can continue the debates with the commission as well and bring the, some of the findings that we have found and some of the examples of good and bad practice as well uh, to inform that debate. Maybe I can add a few words on my side. Uh, we had, the Pompidou group does, does not have a stand on the issue of uh, regulating cannabis. We just are following what is happening. And of course, many things are happening. What we have been doing is that we have invited a representative of the Canadian government to have an exchange of views with the Pompidou group member states that was supposed to take place in November last year. But due to the health situation, it was not possible to do it. But uh, it's forthcoming probably for October this year. Then I would like to say something else also on the issue of human rights and drug policies is that we have created an expert group which is building uh, self-assessment indicators for member states so they, they can um, analyze through this tool uh, how much uh, the, their drug policies are in line with their human rights obligations under the Council of Europe conventions, and not only the Council of Europe conventions, but also UN uh, uh, human rights uh, conventions, because in the Pompidou group we have three countries which are not members of the Council of Europe, so which are not binded by the Council of Europe conventions, Mexico, Israel and Morocco. And then uh, I would like also to, to raise another issue and draw your attention to something which is not directly linked, but there is a link. It is the issue of drug consumption rooms. Uh, and we are organizing on the 1st of July, the second European seminar on drug consumption rooms, which will bring together uh, the countries and the cities which are hosting a drug consumption room in order to uh, show it as uh, uh, good practice and maybe encourage other countries to uh, use these same models which are existing already today in 10 European countries. So this will happen on 1st July in Strasbourg and the plan is to establish um, uh, network of European drug consumption rooms uh, in order to uh, share good practices and also, as I say, encourage other cities which are considering uh, hosting such a room uh, to set up such a drug consumption room. Thank you so much, Dennis. I think we don't have more time. There are more questions, so maybe I, I promise that I will send them to the speakers and maybe later on they can answer if they consider so. Um, okay, to conclude, uh, on the start of the side event, uh, someone told me that there were 150 people on. So I really want to thank uh, all the participants to get engaged to this uh, side event, but also especially the speakers and the co-organizers to be here with us for your um, um, transferring your, your knowledge, your, your expertise 
on these issues, issues which are very, very complex. We all have to, to end all this. Uh, I mean, uh, it's um, for us a pleasure to, to uh, organize uh, these kind of initiatives. And we just uh, wish you uh, be safe, please be safe. And let's see if next, uh, the next commission on narcotic drugs, we can meet uh, in person. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye.